We humans have lived as hunter-gatherers for 99% of our history. But it's during the last 1% of that time, the past 12,000 years, that we've seen the most dramatic transformation in our lives. What triggered the change? Goats, cows and plants like these. Between 5 and 7,000 BC, we also became pastoralists and farmers, domesticating animals and cultivating crops. We started to form ties beyond those based merely on kinship. We developed a more varied lifestyle, which in time led to urban centres and great civilizations. In this program, we chart the progress of African history at this key stage of human development. Here in Zimbabwe, you find some of the best agricultural land anywhere in Africa. But land is so much more than just soil for farming. It is integral to identity, culture and the ancestors, and it provides the foundation for a complex system of beliefs that has lasted throughout the generations. We also see how the wealth of archaeological evidence, oral tradition, songs, dance and art all help us to understand and document earlier African history. These sources, interpreted and explained mostly by Africans themselves, form the basis for a unique project undertaken by UNESCO on which this TV series draws its expert opinion and facts. UNESCO succeeded in managed to mobilize around 350 historian experts, other specialists, to really rewrite and to, and to change the, the perspective on, on, on African history. The result is The General History of Africa, a series of volumes compiled by experts under the supervision of UNESCO. Early humans lived as hunter-gatherers. They lived from what the men could hunt and the women could forage. It was the women who provided most of the food because wild berries, fruits and nuts were a much more reliable source of food than hunting animals. So people moved around to where they knew they would find food. This represented what historians describe as the Stone Age, which lasted some three million years. Our species, Homo sapiens, which evolved in eastern and southern Africa, first appeared in its very early or archaic form around 400,000 years ago. Modern humans, anatomically the same as we are now, have only been in existence for a relatively short time, for about 200,000 years. By about 90,000 years ago, we had populated the whole continent of Africa. Around 60,000 BC, something happened that made us start leaving Africa, probably from what we now call the Horn of Africa to what is today the Southern Arabian Peninsula, across to the Middle East and then to Southeast Asia. Eventually, these migrants would populate the whole world. Why did they leave Africa? Well, the population of the continent came under threat from climate change. Over a period of several thousand years, the climate dried out and population numbers dropped as food and water became harder to find and early humans began to compete for scarce resources, rather like these elephants and buffaloes in Botswana in southern Africa. So under pressure and fighting for survival, they migrated. At this point in our history, human beings were all dark-skinned. In time, their appearance would change to suit their new habitats. As far as we know, as the genome is unraveled, the skin colour in terms of the lighter version and the, the blue eyes and, and the sort of characteristics of the Caucasian is a very recent uh, development and the switch seems to have occurred between eight and 10,000 years. So would that be about the time frame we were all black till 20,000 years ago? I think it's highly probable that we were, but until you find the skin, you've got to be careful that you, you may be mistakes in the genetic interpretation. But the likelihood of all people being dark-skinned up until very recently is the strongest case at the moment. 
But what we're examining in this programme is the history of those people who remained in Africa. What was the pattern of their development? It's difficult to generalise about the whole of Africa because climatic conditions vary from region to region. But, to put it simply, over the millennia, by about 8,000 BC, the climate improved and gradually became more favourable to supporting life again. There were more forests and green areas of land, and the climate could be very wet. The Victoria Falls here in Zimbabwe, surely one of the most iconic and best known images of Africa. The spectacular falls are the waters of the Zambezi River, which flows through several southern African countries, making the region one of the most fertile on the continent. By about 7 to 8,000 BC, early humans were beginning to protect the wild animals which were of most use to them, like wild goats, sheep and later on cattle. Over time, they bred these animals which led to their domestication and gave rise to what we call pastoralist communities. Professor Felix Chami is a Tanzanian historian specialising in early human settlements. I've come to meet him on the beautiful island of Zanzibar. The coast of West Africa has been settled from more than 30,000 years ago. We found remains of a culture which is of people who are hunter-gatherers. Actually, they are hunting Animals such as a giraffe, animals such as antelopes, all the animals which is in Serengeti today, they were already in Zanzibar here. From the Stone Age tradition, we come to another tradition known as Mesolithic. The Mesolithic tradition comes in at the time when there was a lot of flooding, a lot of water. And uh, here, people are, are eating a lot of marine creatures, a lot of aquatic animals, but they are still hunting. There was a bridge between mainland Tanzania and today, Unguja, Zanzibar. So it seems like the people of Stone Age did actually cross the bridge from the mainland to Unguja. Unguja is the old name for Zanzibar. Yeah, exactly. And even today, too, we still use it. But by the time of Neolithic, then, starting from about 6,000 years ago, we are having cattle being brought the, to the islands. We are having chicken being brought maybe from Southeast Asia. We are having all types of domesticated animals on the islands of Zanzibar, suggesting these people are probably in great contact with the people of, of the mainland, but also they are in contact with people of other continents, Southeast Asia, maybe, and see in, in, in other places. Today, you have to travel by ferry from Zanzibar to the mainland of Tanzania, which is where I'm going to find out more about how pastoralists lived in ancient times. The Rift Valley, which encompasses much of East Africa, including parts of Ethiopia, Kenya and Tanzania, has some of the best evidence of how early humans lived. There are many traces of pastoralism throughout the region. We know that from the overwhelming number of goat and cattle remains found here. And when it comes to people, few better depict the link between humans and their cattle than the Maasai. The Maasai are the best known of the tribes that are still pastoralist today. They live mostly in Kenya and here in Tanzania. Some are nomadic and move around with their animals looking for fresh pasture. It's the Maasai boys who are responsible for herding livestock.
the Maasai take their name from the language they speak, Ma. They get all their basic needs from cattle, meat, milk, blood, hides and dung for building materials. Hinama Marite is a local Maasai guide. No cattle in Maasai societies, no life, because they depend on everything. It's the, it's the money, it is uh, its house, because we use the cow dunks to make our houses, and also for, it's our part of our food. It's everything in the Maasai people. Give us some examples then of why cattle is so important to the Maasai people. Food. They can have blood, they can have meat, they can have uh, milk. This means no milk, no meat, no Maasai people. So it is very important for them to have cattle. Unless... What do you do with the blood? I hear it's also a cure for a hangover uh -huh. when the men have been drinking too much alcohol. Yeah, uh, the blood is containing a lot of protein. It's very good for the Maasai warriors because the warriors are the soldiers and their security in the societies. So they can have the blood to be strong enough. It's not for the old people in the societies, they can have the blood, but for it is very good for the Maasai warriors. Have you taken cattle blood? Many times. <laughs> and does it make you feel better? Sure. The Serengeti in northern Tanzania has some of the most beautiful animals on Earth. But the animals are also wild. So to keep them away from their huts, the Maasai put up fences made of acacia thorns around their settlements. This also means they can protect their herds from the wild. Once animals like these relied on humans for protection, we say they had become domesticated. Jumbo. Oh, hello. At the Maasai settlement, I get chatting to one of the older women, Nono Olukula, who's looking after her granddaughter, Naite. Incidentally, it's the women who build the houses. They're made of mud, sticks, grass, and cow dung bound together with cow's urine. Levisho. How far do you have to walk to collect firewood every day? How long does that take? It seems to me that the women work much harder than the men. <laughs> All the while, as Nono talks to me, she shields her little granddaughter from the strong sunlight. Then she invites me inside her hut. Thank you. I see the firewood and then there are two sleeping areas. So who sleeps on this side and who sleeps on that side? Three men sleep there and the mom and kids sleep in here. Meanwhile, little Naita's mother, Nangututi, is preparing to make her regular and gruelling walk for several kilometres to fetch water. Pastoralist communities all over Africa, not just the Maasai, have to make the most of the meagre resources in their environment, and this has led to an exceptional capacity for survival and adaptation, as well as a sophisticated system of solidarity. For more on early pastoralists in Africa, I meet Professor Bebe, a Zimbabwean historian who contributed to the General History of Africa volumes. What we should always remember is that for a very, very long time and for many centuries, domestic animals were not owned by the entire society. The very powerful ones emerged who were able to organize groups of men into uh, soldiers and so on for the purposes of, first of all, heading, and secondly, for the purposes of raiding cattle from other communities in order to accumulate 
the desire to accumulate wealth by those powerful individuals is the one that brings about the creation of chiefs and the hereditary system within society. Because then once this powerful individual has accumulated that wealth, he strives to keep it within the family. And how does he do that? By so many ways. First, by creating an army for himself, and secondly, through marriages and so on. In this region, if you have careful, you're a very rich person, very rich person. Even today, I do have Kekel. And I'm very proud of owning Kekel. So are you rich and powerful then? No. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. No, 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 no. I'm not powerful, but I'm rich. <laughs> Glad to hear it. <laughs> we know that at the same time that Africans began to herd animals, they also began to cultivate crops at around six to 7,000 BC. Right across Africa, people began to live from farming. By 1000 BC, there was a substantial agricultural base on the continent. People began to build permanent shelters for themselves and planted the strongest seeds. When those plants could no longer grow wild without human cultivation, the plant was described as having become domesticated. And that is the start of farming. Paleontology, with its rich field of sub-disciplines like paleobotany and palynology, which is the study of pollen grains and other spores, help us to unlock a great deal of knowledge about our past. Palynologists can help tell us where conditions were wet enough to provide our human ancestors with food and help us work out what they might have had for breakfast. Thank you very much. Thank you. Before written records, before you have the recollection of oral tradition, we have to look for other sources to give us uh, historical data as historians. If you are working on the prehistorical period and you do not have um, written records, then you have to look for alternative sources. And uh, for these alternative sources, we look towards discipline like um, archaeology, linguistics, paleobotany, paleozoo, and uh, a host of other related sources. <laughs> In early African farming, land was commonly owned. Today, it's often more of a family affair. The Dube household owns a farm in the Matobo Hills in southwest Zimbabwe. Charles, his mother Suzanne, and his two wives Kukanya and Sibongile grow a variety of crops, including sorghum, maize, beans, and groundnuts, with the help of their children. Grandmother Suzanne leads the family in singing a song about how hard it is to weed crops. Oh, she wails, who will do this backbreaking work when I'm no longer here? She's more than 70, and her manner is sprightly and energetic. Dube, by the way, means zebra in the local Ndebele language. It's a Sunday, so the children can help the grown-ups because there's no school today. And even the little ones don't want to be left out. After a long day in the field, the family head back home. They've worked up an appetite, so the women prepare a meal with some of their homegrown produce. 
The children, meanwhile, enjoy a well-deserved break. And their father, Charles, brings the goats back into the family compound. Patisa <laughs> Niati is a retired local science teacher who's written extensively on Zimbabwe's history and heritage and now runs a much acclaimed cultural centre. He brings me to meet the Dubey family. Nice to see you. Yeah. Hello. Hi. I'm fine. Hi. Hi. Hello. Hello. Hi. These are your two wives. Yes. yes. Hello. How are you? How are you? Fine. Yeah, good. So you have a lot of work to do in the family, on the farm and also in the house and the children. Yes, it's a lot of work. A lot of work. Yeah. What time do you wake up in the morning? Early six o'clock. Six in the morning. Yeah. That sounds good. You have a bit of a lion. <laughs> I thought you were going to say 4, 5 a.m. <laughs> it's still dark at 6. OK, I'll let you off. So you get up and you also wake up at the same time. You wake up at 5. Oh, so you do get the lion. You see, I was right. <laughs> She's younger. She's your younger wife. Yes, because oh, I see. make fire for the children to school. Yeah. So you put you make a fire in the morning for the kids to go to school, <laughs> and then who makes breakfast? She's the one. She's the one who does the breakfast. She's younger than me. Aha! Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> does she make you breakfast too? Yes. That's yes. nice. <laughs> and what about you, Suzanne? Um, you must know the best recipes, how to make the food perfectly. Mm -hmm. So you teach the younger generation how to make tasty food. Mm -hmm. She says, yes, she teaches them how to make a, a nice re recipe. All right, yes. good. And what about you, Charles? Tell us the seasons and how you plant your crops. We do farm in <laughs> October if there is rain in time. Now, for this year, uh, we planted it uh, 18 December because there wasn't rain. But now it's plenty of rains. Yes. So, Patisa, it's interesting, mm -hmm. isn't it, that yep. Charles is talking about agriculture, which is still rain-fed, mm -hmm. as it was in the oh, days gone ago. by, centuries exactly, ago. Exactly. But that does mm -hmm. rather leave people open to um, food shortages when there is a drought, when there isn't enough rain. It does. And I think what has happened over the centuries, this place has become drier. It's very clear. But this year has been unique. But again, because some farmers do not apply fertilizer or cattle manure, then when there's too much rain, it, it's disaster again. Right. Because there's water locking and the, the, their crops start uh, yellowing. So the crops and, become waterlogged. Oh, yeah, so water too much rain is no good. Disaster. Yeah. And too, too little, little rain is disaster no good. Again. You want yes. a happy medium. Yes. Mm. But this kind of farming is very labour intensive. It is. It means it you is. have no mm. economies of scale. No. Again, that's how farming has been conducted throughout the centuries in Africa. That's right. That's right. It yeah. is labour intensive, yes. All that talk of rain with Charles, and the rain mm. has come down and as we speak. And the rain has come. Well, I think um, because the rain's quite heavy, we should let these, these good people, the Dubé family, yes. get back yeah, into their right. shelter. Yeah. And I'm sure it's time for uh, everybody to have their, uh, their supper. Evening meal. Yes. Yeah. OK, Evening thank meal. you so much. Thank you. Yeah. Goodbye. Yeah. Goodbye. Yeah. Goodbye. Bye-bye. One development that had a huge impact on farmers in Africa was the use of iron, which may have started as early as 2500 BC. Hardier and more efficient tools could be made from iron once it had been melted or smelted. Patisa wants to show me a spot where iron was smelted hundreds of years ago. 
to help us find the exact location, we're accompanied by Mishek Dubey, a local man. So, yeah. Patissa, Dubey is leading the way to yes. show us a very old iron smelting furnace. That's right, that's right. And how old is... Oh, gosh, we have to climb this to yes, get to it? Yes, 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 that's it. That's oh, my it. goodness. I'm not very good at climbing. Things you have to do to discover history, right? OK. Whoops. You see now why I... Sorry, oh. I decided to leave oh, the... careful, careful, Dubé. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's, he's using the wrong route. He's using, mm. he's using the wrong route. Yeah. But he's supposed to be our guide. So this is it. This is it. This is the furnace, yes. The smelting so furnace. So what would they do to smelt the iron? There are two ingredients that are critical. Because this is a chemical yes. reaction. Uh -huh. It must be iron ore, hematite and carbon. Right. From bent wood. So you'd get the carbon from trees from the, the from trees, trees around trees, here? Not from a particular tree, which oh. when it burns, it does not produce ash. So there would have been furnaces like this all over, all over the continent. And there are many of them, mm. many, many of them. And then they would take the iron that's been melted by mm. then and then use it to fashion into objects. Whatever implements like, for example. Right, this is a type of wall. You can see the mammoth size of this wall. However, what is important to see is that this sharp end, it tells you it was not for weeding, right. but was used for digging to make riches. This area used to be waterlogged. So to plant crops, you needed to raise some riches so that the crops are off right. the water line. And then, and then Dubé also got this axe. That's right, the axe. Is that very sharp? Not very sharp, oh, no, but uh, anyway, this is one of the products. There's also, because of course, iron, was very useful for fashioning weapons for defence and attack. That's right, particularly so... spears. So, wars. Those who already had possessed iron technology were winning the wars using spears. You want to be careful with that, Patisa. Yeah. <laughs> He's aiming it at you. No, no, no. Gonna... no, no, no. <laughs> oh, himpiga <laughs> islome. Oh, snabo. Oh, nasimga islome. Oh, snabo. Oh, zanim sabentina. Oh, nasim. I himpiga islome. Oh, snabo. This is Ndebele war song. So it's a war song, right? OK, yes. thanks. Thank I love this spear. Hmm, I wonder who I could use this on. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. One of the best examples of how the Iron Age brought progress right across Africa is here at this site of Great Zimbabwe in the centre of the country. Although the remains of the buildings you can see around me date back to between the 12th and 15th centuries, this site at Great Zimbabwe was inhabited many hundreds of years earlier by pastoralists and farmers who became adept at ironworking. And it was they who laid the foundations for the great civilization that was based here. Iron technology, when it comes in, it's revolutionary. The coming in of the Iron Age transformed societies because, first of all, there was the need to control the source of iron itself. And then secondly, there was need to control the people who were experts. Not everybody could make iron or could make forges and so on. Uh, they were experts. Uh, the smiths were... <laughs> We're really specialists. By about 500 BC, ironworking was well established across much of Africa. 
The use of iron tools enabled farmers to work the land better. An abundance of food led to improved nutrition, larger families and expanding populations. Cooking wares and pottery began to be developed to store and carry food. Also, a surplus of food meant that not everybody had to be involved in providing it all the time. It meant that some people could devote a portion of their time to providing services and making goods. This, in turn, led to the beginning of economic activity and marked a significant phase in Africa's development. Iron was a metal that could be fashioned into ornaments. These were valuable goods that were status symbols and they could be bartered for other goods. This market in the Zimbabwean capital Harare has an excellent display of sculptures worked from just iron or iron combined with scrap metals. Hello, hi. Uh, hello, how are you? Good I'm Zainab. How are you? I'm Alan. Hello, Alan. Yeah. Nice to meet you. Sorry to disturb you from your work. Yeah, it's so, okay, really. are these sculptures, these iron sculptures, your work? Yeah, it's my work. Yes. Uh -huh. So typically, how long would it take you to make a sculpture? Two, three, four days. Two to three, maybe four days yeah, if it's bigger. Days, yes. That sounds like a lot of hard work. Yeah. How do yeah. you actually put the metal together? Uh, we, we weld it. You yes. weld it? Yes. How do you stop the um, iron from rusting? Uh, we use clear varnish. Clear varnish? Yes. Oh yes, of course, you can see the sheen on them. Yes. So which is your favourite piece? It's chicken. You like the chicken? Yeah, the it's because you like eggs for breakfast. Yeah, I like eggs for breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> and what do people who come shopping here, what, what, what are the, the best selling figures? The best selling figures, especially this cock. Really? Yeah. Why and do the, they like it? Does it have some cultural significance? Uh, it is It is an alarm. Every hour, it rings the bell. Wakes you up. Yeah, wakes you up. Do that again. <laughs> <laughs> Using iron to make statues and sculptures is a tradition that goes back thousands of years in Africa. The most striking example of these are the famous Nok statues, so-called because they were discovered in the village of Nok near the Jos Plateau region of Nigeria. They are terracotta figures decorated in iron dating to about 500 BC and are proof that a sophisticated society existed early in this part of West Africa. The Nok culture, which probably ended about 200 AD, is believed to have been an early centre of ironworking in Africa. There's also archaeological evidence of iron cultures in other parts of West Africa. In the northwest of Senegal, not far from St. Louis on the Senegal River, in grassy farmland off the beaten track, you come to a hilly area which is actually an Iron Age site. And if I worked with the leading Senegalese archaeologist, Professor Hamadi Bokum, I might never have found it. I've come to Rao, about 220 kilometres north of the capital, Dakar, to tell you about these ancient burial mounds. I've counted about seven in the vicinity, but in total there are about 10,000 of these burial mounds, also known as tumulus or tumuli. And buried beneath me, it's believed, would have been people of high birth, nobles, warriors, and they were buried along with their artifacts and uh, ornate jewellery. And you know, this is clear evidence that centuries ago, there were civilizations that flourished in this part of West Africa. The earliest tumulus is about 100 years BC, and the latest one is about 1500 AD. Ils sont funéraires au sens vraiment premier du terme. Ce sont des ensembles clos, c'est-à-dire des personnages plus ou moins importants de la société sont décédés. Il y a le dépôt de la personne décédée avec éventuellement des personnes sacrifiées pour l'accompagner, des animaux aussi sacrifiés et surtout il y a tout le mobilier funéraire qui accompagne la personne décédée. Ce mobilier il est très variable, c'est des ustensiles de tous les jours, c'est aussi des armes ou alors des objets de parure faits dans différents matériaux qui peuvent être de l'or, de l'argent, du cuivre ou aussi du fer ou les alliages de tous ces métaux à la fois. 
Back in Zimbabwe, you can see the treasured artefacts of modern life. Mobile phones, for instance, and how many of us love talking on those. Of course, it's we humans alone who have the power of speech, through which we convey meaning, thoughts and feelings. But spoken language is also critical to understanding and documenting Africa's history. To find out what happened in the past, historians draw on the continent's great oral tradition. Zimbabwean cultural expert Patisa Niati has invited a friend of his, Musa Dungeni, a retired headmistress, for me to meet at his home in Bulawayo. She not only comes from a long line of storytellers, but is also descended from a famous 19th century king who fought against European colonizers. Who tell stories about animals and people, the purpose being that we want them to be entertained. We want them to learn their history and we want to, to teach them morals, good morals. Yes, we do uh, communicate our history. I think it's important to point out that uh, when a community is, is illiterate, this is not to say it does not document. All communities document their history. They document uh, their wants, their fears, their, their, their morals. Uh, their critical values, all these must be recorded, and indeed they do record. Were they just stories or was there also poetry or songs? Usually, when you tell a story, there is a song, like... Arts and crafts are also an expression of knowledge, culture and heritage. The textiles on display at this craft market in the Matobo Hills in Zimbabwe are typical of African prints, distinctive for their bold and colourful designs. This man proudly displays his batiks. They're cotton prints with the patterns applied using a waxing technique. Meanwhile, Bright Mabena wants to show me the cultural significance of his carvings. You know, I'm looking for um, artwork that yes. depicts history. Yes. Is there any piece here that you could draw to my attention that does that? Yes, I've got this piece. This piece here, so this yeah. mask. What yes. Does, what does this tell us about your history? This tells us about that uh, the first shows that the people who lived earlier lived by eating fish as their staple food, uh, especially among the big rivers up to Zambezi River. So their substitute food were animals. So that's the, when they fished and that's when they hunted You animals. hunted animals. As this red color shows that uh, they, were, they lived by hunting, this indicates uh, a blood. Oh, so the, the, symbol, red, the red symbol, strip there is a symbol of blood. It's a symbol of blood. Oh, interesting. Now, because uh, people have been taught about keeping bushes and animals safe. Protecting wildlife. Protecting wildlife. They are no longer hunting these animals. Instead, they are keeping them safely mm. in the parks and some forests. Bright Mabena's carvings illustrate the continuity of Africans' traditions, how people link their present with their past. That continuity is evident in art and textiles, but also in the practice of religion. And one enduring belief system is the veneration of nature and the ancestors. Before Christianity and Islam came to Africa, the people adhered to their traditional religions. This community in a remote part of the Matobo Hills, like tens of millions of Africans across the continent, still believe in the religion of their ancestors. There are two things that are very important. Ululation, it's a show of reverence. And then secondly, they were mentioning the name of the ancestor. That, that's very important. So through ululating and also clapping hands. When you clap hands, you are showing reverence. 
and it summons Someone. the spirit. That's right, that's right. That's the whole purpose. And does she drink this concoction, this frog? Yes, this. Thank you very much indeed for showing that. Thank you. Yeah, Thank you. You're going to help me get up. Oh, cool. I need help. Thank you. Okay. Thank, Thank, you. Thank you very much. I saw. Dance and song are also a way of expressing heritage and tradition and relaying information from one generation to the next. These women in Amagugu, just outside Bulawayo in Matabililand, are performing a rain dance. The first thing that we need to know is that music and dance are art forms. And an art is expressive. It's a form of documentation. Africa did not write. But this is not to say Africa did not document. Africa documented through visual art, through performance arts. And it tells a lot about the people, their history, their values, their perceptions, their worldview. It's all about symbolism. The color black is a cloud pregnant with water. And then the way Liz's leg rattles, that is when now it's raining. Cha -cha 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 -cha. It's already raining. The drums, the sound from the drum. And then it's going boom, boom. That's thunder. Then you have created the sound of rain. And then their movement, the choreography, is the twirling clouds. Now you are creating a rain ambience. That way it rains because you have created conditions that are reminiscent of rain. Do you honestly believe that a dance can make the kind of formations that you talk about that we need for rain? Yes, I'll tell you one critical problem with this world. There are people who think we can understand this world through the eyes of one culture. I don't believe that one. This world is too complex to be understood, interpreted by one culture. But what has happened is there are cultures that think they are superior to others. And their view of this world is the view. This has been the problem. So science... Which culture are you talking about there? It's Western but... culture, obviously. I have the advantage of understanding culture, understanding science, and I'm grateful that I did science. So when I look at a dance, I understand it better. And I have argued that you are not going to understand the African phenomena if you don't understand science. Because our dances, the whole culture is inspired by the cosmos. And the cosmos are characterized by rhythm, seasonality, periodicity. That's what characterizes our culture. So there are many layers when you look at uh, a music, at a performance. History, it's, it's a people's culture, it's a people's heritage, their values, it's everything. As Africans work on building their future, many believe their efforts should focus on the development of their science, industry and technology. But Africans must also understand their past in order to assert their identity and control their present narrative. Everybody, young and old, African and non-African, should understand that Africa's history, heritage and tradition should be celebrated. It is part of our global story. In the next programme, we see how once Africans began to live in permanent communities, they embarked on building some of the world's greatest urban settlements like that of ancient Egypt, the best known and most glittering of Africa's civilizations. <laughs>